Dave was on the schedule this morning with us, but he's kind of got sleeping his head out the window and got a cold. <laughs> We're going to, uh, I just sang the song a couple Sundays ago, Brother <laughs> Phil sang it, and after I'd like to, to sing it with you. And you know, I, I think just like the Word of God, uh, there are songs that are really anointed of the Lord by the writer. The writer was anointed when, when they wrote the song. And this is one of those songs we're preaching this morning on, on prayer, on powerful and intense prayer. And I believe that this song speaks about it. It does matter to God about you and about your need. The devil would like to tell you that God doesn't care, but he does care. He just has his own way and his own time. You can't hurry God no matter what you do. He does things the way he wants to do them, when he wants to do them, and how he wants to do them. And we must trust him in that process. And if we do, we learn faith, and God gets the pleasure of ministering to us. Can you say amen? amen. So just pray for us. We've never tried this together, but just remember the words because as we sing them because the words are powerful.
Sometimes the devil can take statements that we make and compound them in our hearts to give us excuse for doing what we want to do. But I, I want to say this statement because it's a true statement that it doesn't matter what you've done. He still cares about you. How many believe that? Amen. He still cares about you. I don't care how bad you've been. And that's not good if you're forced to be bad. But it doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter how far you've strayed. The important thing is that you came back. Can you say amen? amen. You came back. Because that's what matters to him concerning you. Is that you serve him with all your heart and all your life. There isn't anything else in this world that really, really matters with exception to Jesus. There just isn't much else that matters. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, we are going to be preaching about prayer. And uh, we want to begin reading in Luke chapter 22. And again, I seem to refer to these portions of Scripture so much as part of our text, not always all my text, but part of them, and especially in this case, this morning, we're getting ready for revival, uh, next week uh, our evangelist will be with us beginning on Sunday morning, and he'll be ministering to us uh, through the middle of, week, of the week, and he's had a great experience happen to him. Uh, he's like me, and I don't understand why. You know, pastors and preachers get so involved in ministering to other people that a lot of times certain things don't really happen to them. I don't know whether you could understand that or not. But sometimes we minister to other people and the things we see happen to other people don't always happen to us because we're ministering to them and we don't take enough time in that said service or don't have the time to be able to seek for ourselves. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Maybe I messed that up. But at any rate, uh, like me, the evangelist that's coming, which has been here about three times, until just recently had never been slain in the Holy Spirit. And just recently he was slain in the Holy Spirit while, while visiting another service, I believe. And, and when God slayed him, it just changed his life. And, uh, and he has become a completely different person. And so we need to pray that God will, as he shares his heart, with us in these meetings. I'm praying that God will open up a mighty revival to us. Can you say amen? amen. amen. And I'm not saying that that's just, that's one manifestation of what God does to us. Just for a second, I felt led to explain uh, maybe some new folks in the church. And you might have a question about being slain in the Spirit. What does that, why do people get slain in the Spirit? Well, that phenomenon, if you could use that terminology, is is the result of the power of God being so intense upon you, you and your body that your body cannot stand that power. And, and uh, I know I was, when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, the others are speaking other tongues, I was 13 years old. Now I know that I got away from God and I'm, all those circumstances. It's nobody's fault but my own. I made bad choices. But when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking other tongues, 13 years old, I was kneeling, and when God filled me, I don't remember anything that went on until 2 o'clock in the morning. I absolutely remember nothing. I didn't know what was around me. Now that's really getting sort of zapped out. Now I didn't, I didn't fall into the power. I was already on the knees. But I sort of laid over. It was an old pulpit, uh, a platform, and it was about half this height. And instead of an altar, they had that low platform all the way around, and people could kneel right there. And, and when I woke up, my, well, I knew, my mother knew she was in trouble because my stepfather, I knew we were going to face really a bad, bad situation when we got home because he didn't want us going to church anyway. And she was sort of fidgety, although she was a great Christian lady. She wanted so bad to come up and get me up and say, we better get home or we're going to get thrashed by, you know, who? Her and us. And, uh, but I, she, she let me stay there. And at 2 o'clock, I finally come around. I was drunker than a hoot out. Uh, that's an old West Virginia term. And, uh, when I say drunk, I don't mean drunk on wine. I mean drunk on the Holy Spirit. To where it was difficult for me to walk. The power of God was so strong on me that at that age, 
I just didn't hardly know I went home. And you know, God helped us because I prayed for my mother. And we went in the house. And uh, we were fortunate that night. We didn't pray that he would drink himself silly, but he was dead drunk. <laughs> so he didn't know whether we were there or not. So we got to go in the house without getting in a fight. Well, beating around each other. So, and uh, went to bed. And I'll never forget that experience. <coughs> it was a great experience that I've never lost, even though I, uh, let me say this too. It's no excuse for anybody to backslide. Well, to backslide. There's no excuse for anyone to backslide. And that includes me. But I did. But God was gracious. Yes. And through the prayers of my mother and the prayers of people who loved us, God brought me back. I'm glad for that. I'm on my way to heaven. Amen. I've made a lot of mistakes and God's forgiven me of them. But uh, I'm on my way to heaven. Can you say amen? Aren't you glad? How many can raise your hand and say, I'm glad I'm on my way to heaven? Amen. I'm about two thirds. All this going to be full this Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's Luke 22, beginning with verse 39. Reading from the King James Version. There's a statement that was made here. Teach us to pray, which is not in this text, but it's back in Luke chapter 11, which we read in a moment. And my theme this morning is entitled, Teach Us to Pray Powerfully and Intensely. Verse 39 says, And he came out and he went and he was what? That means he was led. There was a desire through the Holy Spirit to go that road. To the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And he was, when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. And he kneeled down and he prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup. He meant the cup of the cross from dying on the cross. Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto Christ from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. After he was, and I'm paraphrasing here, after he was strengthened by the angel, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, he was come to his disciples. He found them sleeping for sorrow. In other words, they were completely worn out. They just were so tired and weak from, from what they had watched Jesus go through uh, to this point and what they felt and knew from what he had told them that he was going to go through that they couldn't handle. And they just fell asleep from exhaustion. And, said, and Jesus said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Now, I believe Jesus was talking to all of his disciples here that were present. But I wonder why he made that statement, ladies and gentlemen. Rise and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Could somebody out loud tell me, especially two individuals that were right there who would need to heed that prayer. Peter, Peter and Judas. Judas is carried. These two men, Jesus knew within just a short period of time, both of these men, he knew already that one would turn him over to the soldiers, and the other one would declare vehemently that he never, ever knew it. And Jesus said to them, pray. Because if you don't pray, you're going to fail. Can you say amen? amen? How many believe if you don't pray yes. and keep prayer in your life, you'll lose your experience. Yes. Amen. You cannot live for God without intercessory prayer every day. Oh, you can live for Him, but you've heard of, you know, I don't know, my mother used to say, don't be a cold potato. I don't know where she ever got that. 
But he said, don't be a cold potato when it comes to serving God. You know, it's, you can go through the motions of being a Christian. You can literally get it down so good that people can hardly tell that you're not praying. You can go through the actions and people won't realize it. But see, the relationship between you and God isn't there. And when that relationship isn't there, it's inevitable, ladies and gentlemen, that there's going to come a time when Satan's going to come at you with, with both fists and with all he's got to try to cause you to fall. And it's right in the middle of when you're, you're not putting your faith in God the way you should, when you're not praying, because praying is communication. When you read the Bible, you're not communicating with God. You're learning. The Bible is your guide. The Bible is your food. Prayer is the only way to communicate with God. It is the only way. Are you with me so far? Amen. That's the Bible. Now I want you to go back with me to Luke chapter 11, verse 1. I just picked it, this text because it just showed me something about Jesus. I've always known, but it brought it more vehement to me. Chapter 11 and verse 1, And it came to pass that as He, as Jesus, was praying in a certain place, when He ceased, one of His disciples said unto Him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught His disciples. And if you were to follow through on the text, you find the Lord's Prayer there, that great prayer that Jesus taught uh, His disciples how to pray. Let us, let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to You in Jesus' name this morning. We thank You for every dear individual and family that's represented here this morning, for all the kids that are downstairs in Children's Church and all that's going on in Your house today. I pray, Father, through Your Holy Spirit that You would minister to us through Your Word. We believe that we get strength through the Word. We get direction through the Word. And then as we pray, the Holy Spirit brings back to our remembrance the word that we have read and heard. I'm asking you, Lord, this morning to make this word real to me and to our congregation in Jesus' name. Cover me with your blood. I'm just a servant, Lord. I'm not worthy to stand here. But God, take me and use me today as your servant, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the question is not, the question is not, Lord, would you teach me how to pray? I hear that question more than anything else. How can I learn to pray? I don't think Jesus is interested as much in teaching us how to pray as to teach us to pray. You know, if you make a step of faith and start praying, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. Isn't that what the Word says? Yeah. Even when you can't say anything, the Holy Spirit. I preached a, a funeral the other day, and, and uh, I don't know, maybe some folks are here. I'm not sure that was there. I know Brother Ron Eddy was there as part of his family. And unbeknownst to me, I, I didn't know whether they would or not, but uh, I'm going to be very candid and very open this morning. Uh, uh, there were several Jehovah's Witnesses in the service. And... You know, Jehovah's Witness is a cult. I'm free to talk like this, aren't I? Amen. Yeah, amen. It's, a cult, it's a cult. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. They don't believe He's the Son of God. They believe He was a good prophet. They don't believe there's power in His blood. They will not confess Christ as their personal Savior. They worship Jehovah. I believe in Jehovah too. See? How many believe in Jehovah God? Amen. I believe in the Father. I believe He's the Father of all. I said Wednesday night, He's the Father of His Son. Jesus Christ. But that day, when I realized, because I had met some of them the afternoon before, and when I got ready to walk into that service, and I spied some of the folks there, fear gripped my heart. I don't know why. But fear gripped my heart because I said, not because I feared people, but because I feared whether I could get up there and speak the word the way I should speak it so that even those who determine that Christ is not the Son of God could through the Holy Spirit be touched by that word. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? And you know, lo and behold, the Holy Spirit, I never did follow my text or my theme. And uh, Ron, I, I don't know how it sounded, 
Brother Ron. But I'll tell you something. The Holy Spirit took over, and for 20 minutes, I preached something. I can't even tell you what I preached. But I know one thing. When the altar call was given, several of those ladies from the Jehovah's Witness raised their hands. Woo! Oh, my God. Can you say amen? Amen. Because I, I remember one thing I preached. And that is Jesus said, if you believe in God, then believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again. Earth is in the end of the utopia. There's going to be a heaven more than 444,000. I expect to be there. Amen. Amen. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus was a prayer. You read, you read the New Testament. Jesus was a prayer. He prayed. And when it came to pass that he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. The first thing I want to share with you this morning concerning prayer. You might want to write these down. These are very important. I believe these will lead us into powerful prayer and teach us how to pray the way the Lord would have us to pray. The first thing, there are demonstrations of prayer. We talk about demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. We talked about one of them just a little bit ago, being slain in the Spirit. We often have talked in times past about under the influence of the Holy Spirit, people dancing in the Spirit. These are, these are uh, demonstrations of that happen to people when the Holy Spirit many times comes on them and blesses them. And it's like something else. You ever go to a ball game and you're really a football player? I know that I'm, I'm very intense. I used to be in playing ball. And if I go and watch our kids play on our ball team, I'm standing up screaming. And my wife says, sit down, sit down. And I'm up screaming, come on, guys, get moving. You're dead. Get up there. Let's go. I'm screaming and yelling. I get turned around. I wish I could go out there. <laughs> you get intense, see. And, and my way of getting intense, I jump up and start screaming. Well, when people feel the touch of God, it, it, if they worship the Lord, sometimes they manifest that, that touch of the Lord in, in various ways. Can you say amen? Yeah. That's, that's uh, not necessarily Pentecost. Oh, I'm so glad I'm in Pentecost. That's not necessarily Pentecost. That's manifesting the touch of God. Anybody can do it. I've seen people do it in, in other denominations. You see, when the power of God comes over, well, I, I must keep moving. Prayer is a, is a very, very unique thing. I want to read something to you. Remember the Sputnik? How long ago was that when they sent the Sputnik? That was in the 60s, wasn't it? When they sent the Sputnik up. Anyway, Sarah Smith Reed wrote, Prayerful Sputniks. From its launching pad of suffering soars my missile through the air. Past the sun and moon and planets freighted heavily with prayer. Faith divine is the propellant. Faith that God cannot deny. Sending it a zillion light years to the city in the sky. There the Father hears the beeping, knows the signal as his own. Tunes in lovingly and listens as it works around the throne. Back it zooms. <laughs> Can you say amen? Back it zooms, the answers bearing from the one whom I adore. Ball and blessing, peace and power. Praise His name forevermore. How many have experienced that? Praise the Lord. That's just about the way prayer is. That's just about the way prayer is. Praise the Lord. There are demonstrations of prayer. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. We want to share this with you this morning. It says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Lifting up, here's the key, lifting up holy hands without wrath 
and doubting. I wonder how long it's been, ladies and gentlemen, since when we went to prayer, we practiced lifting our hands unto God. Well, Pastor, that's only when you praise the Lord, not according to the Word of God, didn't it? Not according to the Bible. The Bible says when you pray, lift up holy hands without doubt and wrath. It's a way of demonstrating prayer. It's a way of getting God's Spirit to come down and tell you that your prayers have reached the throne of God. I believe the Bible is full of raising our hands in adoration to God. Amen. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm convinced this morning that if everybody in this place would just close their eyes and raise their hands and begin to pray. Now, when you pray, I'm not asking you necessarily to do this unless you want to this morning, but I'll tell you something. I, I'm tempted to do it because I want to see God move on His people today, and I want to see the Holy Spirit bring this message to our hearts. And there's only one way it can happen, and that is when the Holy Spirit is released into every heart and every life to receive that Word. And my Bible tells me that if you lift your hands... Lift up holy hands without wrath. What else? Without doubt. Not long ago, somebody in, uh, in the circumstance was involved, I could, I could almost say, I understand. They said, you know, I come to a place, Pastor, I'm blaming God. I'm blaming God. I just, I just got to the place that I could feel, I can feel an awful feeling of hate coming up in my heart. Not necessarily for God, but hate for, for everything around me, including religious things. I can feel it coming up. And the Bible says that when you pray, you, to, to get rid of that, raise up your hands and pray without doubting or without wrath. Just lay it aside and begin to worship the Lord. I don't know whether anybody here wants to do it this morning, but I'll tell you what we ought to do for a moment. We ought to just close our eyes, and I don't like to dictate to people what to do. But I'll tell you this, well, I don't feel like doing it, Pastor. Maybe you will have to try it. Amen. It's like peas. I can never get my kids to eat peas. But you know, after sitting there 25 minutes to eat them, one by one, they've only got them down. But let me tell you this morning, I, I don't know whether you've got a need in your life this morning or not. I don't know whether you don't know what your future holds in the next moment or what God is trying to say to you. But if you will do what this scripture says this morning. Now here's what it is. See, there are three times types of prayer. There are prayers of praise. There are pray prayers of thanksgiving. And then there are prayers of request. Now, I don't know what you want to do, but my Bible says, if you want to praise Him this morning, then pray and praise Him. Raise your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. I think we ought to do that right now. I think all of us here, all pastor, not many want to, but anyway, I'll tell you something, folks. If we want God to move, yes. we're going to have to get our minds and our hearts on God. Amen. And when we begin to raise our hands and seek Him, then God's power will fall. I want us just to, whoever will, let's just close our eyes and let's just talk to him. I don't want you to praise him or thank him or ask him a request. Let's just do it right now. Hallelujah. 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 I will therefore that men everywhere pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. God this morning. Hear our praise this morning. Before we ask any request today, we praise your name and glorify your name. We thank you this morning for your goodness and your graciousness and your power. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. We've had our times of request. We've prayed about those requests. Now we lift up holy hands. Hallelujah. Without doubting and we don't blame you for anything, God. We're not blaming the church for anything. We're coming to you because we love you this morning. And we praise you. Right now, God's beginning to touch people because when you raise your hands and you say, I love you, Jesus, He says, if you love me, I'll heal your body. Right now, where you are, people sitting in this area that said, I need a touch in their body. Right now, as you praise the Lord, God will minister to you and heal you and touch you that can't 
dangerous place. Uh, he's healing that right now because the Bible says when we raise our hands, holy hands are to him. Hands that are not defiled. Hands that are not full of sin. Hands that are not doubting. Hands that aren't filled with wrath. And God says, I will come in unto you. I will come in unto you. And I will minister to you. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Just go ahead and pray. I don't want to stop. I tell you, I believe God's already touching somebody here right now. Right now, God's already. The Bible says, when you come to Him, come and raise holy hands on your head. Oh, those hands are undefined. There's anything in your life this morning that shouldn't be there. Get it out first. Ask Jesus to forgive you. Then when you raise your hands, you raise undefiled hands. You raise holy hands unto Him. Demonstrations of prayer. Oh, Jesus, thank you this morning. As we trust you, you'll heal. You'll bring that barricade down. You'll, you'll minister to that, that problem in your business. God, he will, he will minister to that problem. He will minister to your family need. He'll touch your kids this morning that need the grace of God to be a part of He will minister to your life. Ask Him this morning, God, I can't handle this anymore. I need the touch of God on my life. Amazing the holy thing. I need this touch in my body. I don't know what to do about this sickness in my body. I don't know what route to take. The Bible says when lifting holy hands unto him without wrath and without wrath. God will do something for you. God will do something for you right now. Right here. Right now. Hallelujah. The Bible says he'll withhold no good gift from those who love him. No good gift. Tell him the desire of your heart. Don't be afraid to tell him. I need a touch in my eye. I need a touch in my stomach, in my back. And I'm not revealing something God's telling me. I'm just going through the list. My legs are hurting me this morning. I've got cancer. i got breathing problems, lung problems. My mother's bad sick. My father's bad sick. Pastor, they need help. Don't you think God knows that? But He wants you to lift up holy hands and request and praise. God, I love you. Do something. Do something, God, for that circumstance. Step in with all hands. Step in with hands. I need a job. Don't you think God knows you need a job? Bible says, lifting up holy hands unto Him without wrath. Without God. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not one to, to, to do this. I really don't like to ask people to do things. I like for the Holy Spirit to just do it. But this morning, sometimes we have to guide you a little. And I feel like in this message this morning, if, if that raising our hands tells God, I believe you. <laughs> I love you enough that I'm going to praise you ahead of time. I preached uh, one night, uh, one of the nights of the revival this past week up next to Pittsburgh. All those people were full coming up to be prayed for and backsliders coming back to God. And these are people that have been entrenched in other denominations and tried to come into the Pentecostal atmosphere and then their families rejected them and turned away because I won't name the denominations, but in some denominations, if you walk out and go into another denomination, your family will just turn their back on you. They want nothing to do with you. That's what happened. And some of these folks just couldn't handle the pressure. And they left the church and went back to their families so they could feel the love of their families. And and they sacrificed the experience they had found in the Pentecostal church where I was at. That night Pastor came to the out and said almost every family that has left happened to be here today. for some reason. And they all came forward and rededicated their lives to Jesus Christ. You see, folks, and they have their hands raised. Now, I'm not saying that's the only thing to do, but that's one of the demonstrations. And what I've given you this morning is the Bible. It's not something that I concoct. 
Am I correct on that? I've given you the Bible. The Bible says, lifting up only hands without wrath and doubting. When you pray. Am I correct? And so this is something biblical that we need to practice. And I told these families, I said, I must go on. I told these families, I said, listen, start thanking God for the victory now. Start thanking God now. You want to start thanking God ahead of time for your healing. You know, I think you should do that. Yes, Every morning when you get up, if God's doing a progressive healing on you, then you need faith to trust Him. Because progressive healing is day after day after day, you get a little better, a little better, a little better until you're finally whole. Miracles are something that happens instantaneously, right now, this second, which God does many miracles for us all the time. But this morning, if God's beginning to work in you tomorrow morning, you better when you get up. You better thank Him for the healing. <laughs> you see, that's what the Bible instructs us to do. Number, uh, I must move one. I was almost there to number two. Now, let me just share another demonstration of prayer with you. The Bible says, I won't read it, James chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. It tells us the account of Elijah when, when he prayed for rain to stop. And then he went back and prayed for it to start. And I remember he went up to pray and he had his head between his knees and he prayed. This was the demonstration that he was doing here was he was, he was praying in faith. It wasn't because he was Elijah that God answered him. Not necessarily. It was because Elijah had the faith to believe that God would cause it to rain again. And he looked up and he says, they saw a cloud about those. What? Like the size of a man's hand. First cloud they'd seen in a long, long time. There's areas of Israel that still never rains. And most of Israel, it rains no more than 12 times a year. Ever. And they saw, so this was something new for them. They saw this cloud. And it wasn't long until a torrential rain. I mean the whole sky just darkened and it began to rain. You see, there's the demonstration of praying in faith. How about the demonstration of humility? Uh, I've often thought about this. Why do people kneel when they pray? I think it shows humility. I mean, I don't, I'm not to bow. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not to bow my knees to anybody but God. Am I correct on that? Now, once in a while in early marriage, I did that to get my wife to do something. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but overall, there's nobody that we're to bow our knee to save God. And the Bible says before the end of time is over, that, and everything becomes new in the new heaven and the new earth, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that He is Lord. He's the only one to bow our knee to. And I want you to notice in the book of Acts chapter 7, verses 59 and 60, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and, and I'd like to add here, the King James Version leaves out a couple little words here, I'll paraphrase. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He was dying. They had stoned him to death just about. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, this is unique. And, you know, he, he could have went on and said, Oh God, I want to be sure I get there. I want to be sure I get there. You know, and so worried about going to heaven. But he said, in his last breath, he didn't say anything about himself. He says, Lord, lay not this charge to them. Forgive them. I remember Jesus' words as He hung on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. And they spit on Him and ripped His beard and beat Him and nailed Him to the cross and put Him up there. And they cast lots and gambled for His clothes. As He hung there and died, Jesus said, Father, they wouldn't know what they're doing. If they did, they wouldn't do it. You see? That's humility. Then the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. But you know, Jesus was a prayer. And I just felt that it'd be important to read this to you. Because Jesus is our example. Luke 6, 12, write it in your notes. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer.
to God. Now, let me give you a little clue here. In the daytime, Jesus spent most of his days walking from place to place. It was hot and dry and dusty and dirty. He walked from place to place where people would meet and he ministered. This night, he felt want, that word W-O-N-T, a desire, guidance to go pray. And the Bible says that he went and prayed after an exhausting day all day. He prayed all night. All night. What a powerful example Jesus is to us of prayer. Number two, not only, and I could give you 50 demonstrations of prayer, but we don't have time this morning. Secondly, not only are there demonstrations of prayer, but there are demands for prayer. We don't pray just because the Bible says for us to. We pray because there are demands for prayer. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Be careful for nothing. That means don't hold back. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. And might I add, raising of hands? If that goes with the other text I had. Let your request be made known unto God. Someone has said, when praying, do not give God instructions. Report for duty. And I think that's important because God not only wants us to share with Him, but He's wanting to share with us. And prayer is a two-way street. And so many times Christians are guilty of taking their requests to God and then not spending time with God. I, I, I'd like to say something, and, and I'm, I'm going to say it. You know, folks, I think many times Christians are guilty of whenever things start getting bad, then they get prayerful. And they run to God when things are bad. And as soon as things get better, you don't see them. They quit praying. Almost immediately. Don't you think that grieves God? Here He did. He answered your request. He heard your prayer. And you were all, and I don't mean this sacrilegiously or, or downgrading in any way, but you and I have both seen it. People will cry and bawl and seek God. Oh God, if you don't answer, what am I going to do? And as soon as the answer comes, wow, we're over the hump. Back to the same old thing. It happens so often. The Bible instructs us not, not the way to live. The Bible says we're to pray whether we have a need or not because there are times when God wants to speak to us. If the only time we pray is when we have a need, we're not spending time so God can answer us. And He can talk to us and instruct us. Now that's a little vehement, but I didn't mean that personally for anyone. I don't know what your prayer life is. And you don't know what mine is. But I think it's important for us to keep that in mind. What are, what are some of the demands for prayer? Number one, there's a world lost without God. That's one of the things. If you don't have anything else to pray for, pray for the sinner. That they will find God. Number two, there's a wickedness that only prayer and the Word of God can penetrate. I don't care what we do. Let me tell you something. If you think, if you think that you can penetrate today's media with what you'd like to be said concerning God and your faith, you're fooling yourself. Because the media isn't going to let you do that. They're only going to portray what they want to portray. And it is humanistic, it is worldly, and it is ungodly. Mm -hmm. They will not tolerate or accommodate truth any other way and, and except 99% of all the truth that's being given in the United States of America right now in the media is done on Christian we call them uh, satellite uh, or stations. There's very little. In fact, I don't know hardly any Christian programming on this cable system. 
I mean, we're starving to death. I wrote and I asked, is it possible to get Christian broadcasting? See how many people you can get to want it. So far, nobody's on the call. Good. Good. That's very so. You see, today's media is reaching 99% of the population with a with a humanistic lie, they distort the truth. They distort the news. I'm sorry. I'm going to tell you the way it is. You'd be surprised when you get on there and they ask you for a comment. They'll let you say five. Oh, you'll speak for five minutes. And they'll put five words on the TV of what you're saying. And they'll pick them out and put them all together into one sentence. To make it a sound the way they want it to sound. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to if we're going to make a change in this world, it's going to take prayer. It's going to take the word because you're not going to do it by trying to get on TV. You're just not going to do it. The only time I see any publication, or well, not publication, any any uh, uh, how can you think of the word? Uh, attention shown to any preachers. On ABC, maybe that's your favorite station, CBS, NBC, is when they want to pick away at their ministry and find fault with them. You never hear anything on those TV stations when they come on and say, this guy is doing a great job, he's a great preacher, many people are getting saved, not yet to hear that, and when they have a discussion about religion, they pick somebody that isn't even saved to come on there and discuss about religion that knows nothing about Jesus. If we're going to change our society, it's going to take powerful prayer. And living the Word. No wonder the Bible says, it doesn't sound good. Well, pastor, churches are fuller now than they've ever been. Large churches everywhere. The Bible says many will be called. Nobody wants to hear this. What's the other part of it? You will be chosen. Wow, that scares me. You mean to tell me of all the people that go to church and claim to be Christians, which I heard on the news the other day that uh, this was from, again, one of the news media, uh, about something, somebody was talking about it, 38 to 40 percent positively claim to be saved. If that's a percent out of all the population, uh, there's a lot of people that are saved. But the Bible says that out of all the people that go to church and hear the Word of God, only a few will be chosen. That means only in comparison to all the billions that have ever come through this world, through birth and, and life and then dying, that only, that only a few in comparison will be saved. That doesn't sound good. But the world needs to hear that today because if we don't pray through, ladies and gentlemen, and get a hold of God on our knees for the loss and for this world and this community, there is only going to be a few negatives. That's God's truth. Because this is still a holy walk. Oh boy. <coughs> preacher told me the other day, I was having coffee with him, about the word Pittsburgh. He said, I quit preaching on the holy ones. I said, Why? Why have you quit preaching on the holy ones? I said, What do you mean when you say holy ones? Clothes or or holiness. He said, either one. I said, why? He said, because the next Sunday only half the crowd comes back. <coughs> he said, my people don't like that. They want to come, they want to associate with the church, but they don't want to live it. Now that's not according to the word of God. Is this too strong? No. Oh. Okay, this is that's not according to the word of God. The Word says that we must live a holy life. Because there's a wickedness that only prayer can penetrate. There are wounds and suffering in this humanity that only prayer can bring the healing balm to. And unless we get into a spirit of prayer, I mean powerful prayer, things aren't going to change. Number three. Still with me? Yeah. I got it. Number 
First, there are demonstrations of prayer. Secondly, there are demands for prayer. Thirdly, I think this is probably one of the chief things. There's got to be a desire to pray. I mean, if you have no desire to pray, it's agony. It's just like anything else. It's like eating peas when you're alone. Yeah. I mean, you sat there, and I can remember, I can remember one of my sons. He sat there. I said, you're going to sit there to eat them, son, just to see if you like them. I mean, you know, put them out there. I don't like that. Never touch it. I don't like it. And he'll remember that if he's here this morning, which he is. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe your children or, or you have something, but, you know, for maybe that wasn't right. Maybe you say, well, you're a bad parent, but uh, I wanted to be sure that he got a taste of it. He only had 12 peas to be <laughs> So it took him an hour to eat those 12 peas. You see, if we don't have a desire to pray, oh, it can be sickening. When you get down and try to pray, and you get so weak because you're fighting, trying to pray, and you don't feel like praying, you don't feel like praising, you don't feel like getting into God, but you've got to ask God to give you a desire to pray. A desire. Acts chapter 16 and verse 13 says, On the Sabbath we went out of the city by a river, where prayer was wont to be made. There was a desire again to pray. And we sat down and talked with the woman there. Someone has said, I, I want to share this with you, I'm not sure who the writer is, Five young college students before ordination spent a Sunday in London and were anxious to hear some well-known preachers in churches other than their own. They found their way on a hot Sunday to Spurgeon's Tabernacle. While waiting for the doors to open, a stranger came up to them and said, Gentlemen, would you like to see the heating apparatus of the church? They were not particularly anxious to do so on a hot day in July, but consented. They were taken down some steps and a door was thrown open and their God, this stranger whispered, there, gentlemen, is our heating apparatus. They saw 700 people bowed in prayer, seeking a blessing on the service that was about to take place upstairs. Their unknown God was none other than Reverend Spurgeon himself. Are we surprised that, the, that Spurgeon's sermons are still circulated today and that the power of those sermons still are talked about? Why? Because of Powerful prayer. Powerful prayer. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit urges us to pray. In 1 John 2.20 it says, but ye have an unction from the Holy Ghost. That's what it says in 1 John 2.20. You have an unction of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit desires and urges us to pray. Secondly, there is the power of praying in the Holy Spirit. And there's one verse I want to read to you because this is so important for us, especially in the Pentecostal church. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. Just to get your attention, somebody tell me, what does that mean to pray with the Spirit and then pray with the understanding? Just out loud. Somebody praying say. in tongues or praying in your own head. There you go. Either praying in other tongues or praying in English or in, in a known fashion. That's what it means. And the Bible instructs us that we are to pray. I will pray with the Spirit. And, and remember, I gave you out of them eight things that I do every day. I ask the Lord, help me to pray in the Holy Ghost every day. And then there are times we pray in English. If we were in a Bible study, I'd ask you what you thought about that, but we don't have time for that. Number four, not only are there demonstrations of prayer and demands for prayer and desires for prayer, but quickly, then there is dedicated prayer. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications and prayers intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Right back to verse 1, I exhort you, I direct you, first of all, supplications, prayers, and intercessions. How important they are. I believe 
In real prayer, we confess our sins. In real prayer, we commit our wills to God. In real prayer, you ask for God's will. <laughs> then there is determined prayer. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You see, ladies and gentlemen, St. Francis of Assisi wrote, Lord, make me a channel of thy peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may somehow bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith, that where there is despair, I may bring hope, where there is shadows, I may bring light, that where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted. To understand than to be understood. To love than to be loved. For it is by giving that one receives. It is by self-forgetting that one finds. It is by forgiving, uh, forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. I want you to write these down if you have a moment. You see... Determined prayer is this. We choose the time to pray. God doesn't choose it for you. We choose the time to pray. Number two. We choose the place to pray. The Holy Spirit may unction you and may direct you from time to time, but you must make the choice. Thirdly, we choose for whom or what we are to pray. The Holy Spirit may direct us, but we must follow through on that. Aren't you glad that we have the choice to make? Somebody called me, what was it, 11.30 last night? Yeah. I was, you know, was having this couple from somewhere called me on, on the phone and said, me and my husband are having a little argument. I said, yeah. What is it? They said, we can't agree on the fact that that does God choose who's going to be saved or can anybody be saved who wants to? And the husband grabbed the phone and put it up and said, I believe that we have to make our own choice. I said, you're right, brother. You're right. But I said, the Bible says that in, a, in, in, a, in essence, that God through Jesus Christ chose all of us. The Bible says that Jesus died on the cross for all. Is that what he said? Yeah. Is that what it says? So in essence, God has chosen everyone. We make the choice of whether we want to follow it. And that, by that, they hung the phone. Okay? Um, you see, aren't you glad that, that, that you can make your own choice? Hmm? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that we do that? Because that's how prayer becomes powerful. It's when we make our own choice to pray. Make the choice to get a hold of God. I want to close with this. I think one of the most important things in my life is then there is the prayer number six. There is the prayer of deliverance and duty. Deliverance and duty. Second Chronicles. And we close it. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Verses 14 and 15. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now mine eyes, now listen to this, now mine eyes shall be opened and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. That tells me that if I come to God and I ask Him for deliverance and I lift up holy hands without doubting the wrath. And I seek out His will and purpose. His ears will be open unto me. His hand will be ready to move. And He will minister to me and meet my need. Praise the Lord. I want you to put this down. Pray, pray hardest when it is hardest to pray. Please remember that. Pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. That's when you get a hold of God. That's when you touch Jesus. And remember this, prayer is duty. 
If you can beat the devil in the matter of regular daily prayer, you can beat him at it. But if he can beat you there, he can possibly beat you anywhere. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1 says, Men ought always to pray and not to think. Would you bow your heads with me? There are needs here this morning, and I don't know whether God has already begun an answer to your need this morning. But if you're here this morning and you believe that prayer is your answer to the need that's in your life, and you want to see that request fulfilled, Jesus is here to minister to you and to touch you right now. We want to make these altars open to you. Just before we, we do that, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, one of the first steps of prayer is to be sure that everything is okay between us and the Lord. Is there one with our heads bowed and our eyes closed and say, Pastor, there's some things in my life that I need to take care of. I need for Jesus to cover me with his blood and I need to get these things out of my mind and out of my heart. Remember me in prayer. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Anyone by the upper hand say, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Remember me in prayer. Thank you. I want to be sure that my life is right with God. That nothing is between me and my sin. Nothing. Because that can hinder powerful prayer. That can hinder powerful prayer. Second and last. If you're here, you believe that it's going to take prayer to bring the ministry to your family and your home, healing of your body. You feel like this morning, and God has to speak to you on this. Pastor, I'm going to drop at this altar this morning, and I'm going to pray through. I want God to touch me right here, right now. We'll pray with you. We'll anoint you, Lord. We'll stay with you and pray with you until God brings the answer. Is there one of you? Say, yes, Pastor. I'm one of those people. I believe God began to work at the beginning of this message as we begin to praise Him and raise our hands together in prayer. God began to work, and we must accept Him by faith. Would you stand with me this morning?